Hello, Courageous Church. My name is Ian, and I'm the discipleship pastor here at Courageous Church. Today, I get to continue us through our series called Faith in Action. Now, we started off this series by talking about a book that we read as a church community called Bless. This book, it really gives us some really practical tools for loving our neighbors well. And now we've spent the last several weeks going through the book of James in our Bibles. And if you've watched or listened to those messages in the past, you know that James is just full of incredible wisdom for putting your faith into action. It's just a really dense book. But today we get to talk about what it means to be set apart. A Bible scholar that I find myself often listening to named Tim Mackey describes what it means to be set apart. In this particular podcast, he's talking about what it means to be holy. And he defines, uh, he defines it as being set apart for a specific purpose. And the example that he uses is just wonderful. So think about a bathroom. Bathrooms are set apart for a specific purpose. If you were to take your dinner into the bathroom and eat it there, I think most of us would think that that is super gross. But yet, we brush our teeth in the bathroom. Bathrooms have a specific purpose, and that purpose is not to be messed with. We as followers of Jesus are also called to be set apart, to be holy. In Romans 12 2, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's perfect will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We are supposed to be set apart. If we call ourselves followers of Jesus, people around us should notice that there's something different about us. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says it this way. He says, So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another, another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. This love that you and I are supposed to have should make the world around us curious. I think many of us want to be more like Jesus. That desire within us, I think it's there. We want to draw closer to God. We recognize there's something special about it, but we don't know how. Or maybe we've tried and just kept failing at it. We get frustrated that God wants us to come closer to him and we might even give up. I think most of us want the end result but the process scares us. The process of letting God in to change the way we live our lives, the way we love and the way we think, it can be really intimidating. But if we really want to know what it's like to live out a bold life for Jesus, if we really want to know what it's like to put our faith into action, if we want to really know what it's like to be set apart, this is a crucial step. Throughout this whole chapter of James that we're going to be going through, he's really hard on the recipients of this letter. Just a fair warning, this chapter doesn't end with a nice tied up bow at the end. In fact, most of scripture doesn't actually, and it shouldn't. The Bible leaves us with questions. It asks us to dig deeper. So let's dig deeper today. We're going to start off in James chapter 4, and we're going to read it section by section. We're going to start in verse 1. He starts off with, What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask God, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. 
You want only what will give you pleasure. James is writing this section for a reason. He recognized that the churches he was writing to were fighting with each other. Why else would he write, what is causing quarrels and fights among you? James goes on to talk about these fights among ourselves coming out of our own sinful desires. We want what someone else has. We're jealous of someone else. Someone just rubs us the wrong way. None of these are valid reasons to not show the love of Christ to someone, especially someone that is part of the same church community that you call home. Do you remember the verse that we talked about earlier? In it, Jesus says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. How on earth are we supposed to love our neighbor if we can't even love each other? Even if you don't think that this applies to you right now, Really, take this to heart, because honestly, people are messy. I've worked with people long enough to know that eventually someone will come along that just rubs you the wrong way. But we are called to be marked by our love for one another, so that it will prove to the world that we are Jesus' disciples. And we are to be marked by our love and our unity, not our division. Abraham Lincoln and Jesus both said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. We are called to be a body of believers, unified through Jesus, so that we can love those around us well. We are called to be a people that are set apart. And verse 4 makes that abundantly clear to us. So let's jump back into our text. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Now let's pause here. Now what does James mean by this? Like we talked about earlier, As followers of Jesus, we are called to be set apart. We are called to be indistinguishable from the rest. er, We are not called to be indistinguishable from the rest of the world. People should notice something different about us. Our relationship with Jesus should shine through every aspect of our lives. We are a part of this world, yes, but we are called. And when we choose the world over God, we put up walls between us and God. We create a distance from him. And God won't force us to stay close to him. And he won't force us away. Rather, he gives us the freedom to choose to draw closer to him or to choose to put distance between us. Let's jump back into James, starting in verse 5. He says, Do you think that the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Here, James is giving us a picture of what it looks like to draw closer to God. He's giving us a picture of what it looks like to try and make ourselves more like Christ. 
In studying this passage, I came across a quote from a biblical, biblical commentary that I think helps give us a bigger picture of what goes into drawing closer to God. Now, here's the quote. In verses 7 through 9, a whole series of commandments are given. If followed, contribute to harmony and holiness. James called for the commitment, cleansing, and, oh, wow, contortion. Like a magnet, the call for commitment has both positive and negative poles. Submit to God and resist the devil. The call to submit ourselves to God isn't to just submit ourselves to him, but it's also to turn away from our sinful desires. He gives us a really clear picture of what repentance looks like. The literal definition of repentance is to turn away from or to turn around and then go the other way. Have you ever been driving down a road and needed to make a U-turn? If you have, then you've repented, in a sense. It's that same idea. We don't just stop, but we move towards something else. We go the other way. And in this case, we move towards God. When I first moved to Seattle, I spent some time working as a delivery driver. And I would be driving these big vans down these re narrow residential streets with cars parked on both sides. And sometimes I would need to turn around and go the opposite direction of from where my van was facing. And I wouldn't be able to do it because there were cars parked on both sides, bumper to bumper, up and down these tiny little narrow streets. I couldn't easily turn around because there were things that were in my way. In college, God really got a hold of me because I wasn't loving others well. I had my friend group and we were really tight knit, but outside of those gr that group, especially people that just rubbed me the wrong way, were on my avoid at all costs list. Do you ever have one of those times where you just keep hearing the same thing from lots of different people. That's how God started to get my attention. Sermon after sermon, meeting after meeting, class after class, coaching session after coaching session. I felt like I kept hearing the same thing. Love others well. But I kept letting my own pride and my own comfort get in the way of that. I had to let God remove those things so that I could truly start to love people the way that he intended me to. And if you knew me back then, you probably wouldn't be able to tell that I was a follower of Jesus just from interacting with me. And I was studying to be a pastor. I was not living set apart. I was probably one of the recipients of this letter that James is writing to. It took me a long time to remove that pride and comfortability so that I could truly start to live and love like Jesus. In intentionally reading through this passage, the part where James mentions, let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Really made me curious. What James is not saying is that you should feel shameful for what you've done. But what he is saying is that you should recognize the weight that your actions carry. He's saying that you should recognize it and that you should humble yourself before God. Through James airing out this dirty laundry, as it were, he's calling us to something higher. He's calling us to live the opposite of what he's describing here. We are called to be a people marked by our love, not by our quarrels. Jumping back to what Jesus said to his disciples, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Jesus is calling us to live and love like him. 
He's calling us to be set apart from the rest of the world, specifically through how we love those around us. So what does this practically look like for you as an individual? How can you specifically love your neighbor inside and outside the church? Is there someone in your life that you need to forgive? Have you been holding on to bitterness and anger towards someone? What does that forgiveness look like right now? If you want someone on the Courageous Church staff to reach out to you, fill out our Connect card and check the box that says you'd like to be contacted by someone from our team. You'll see a link to that coming up in the comments here in a second. Or if you simply need prayer for something, fill out that Connect card and let us know how we can be praying for you. Our love for one another is what Jesus said should set us apart from the rest of the world. Is there someone that you need to seek forgiveness from? Or something that you need to seek forgiveness for? Do you simply need to humble yourself and draw closer to God? I challenge you to take some time today to have that conversation. Either with that person or with God. We as a church community are to reflect Christ to the best of our abilities. Not only for the sake of those within our community, but for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of bringing good news to the lost. At Courageous Church, we are all about making disciples who live and love like Jesus. This world is too broken for us to be idly sitting by not living out our faith. There are so many people right around us right now that don't yet know about Jesus. We need to love our neighbors. We need to live out our faith. We need to live and love like Jesus. How are you going to be a part of that? I think many of us already know the answer, but we haven't taken the action towards it. It's time to take action, church. Our city needs the hope of the gospel. Our city needs believers who are blessing their neighbors. Our city needs us to live and love like Jesus. So what are you waiting for? Let's be a people set apart.